This is Mac 1105 section 1.6. In this section, we're going to be looking at other types of equations that we need to learn how to solve, specifically equations involving polynomials, radicals, rational exponents, those that are in quadratic form, as well as those involving absolute value. So all uh, just a variety of techniques for equations other than what you have learned to solve thus far, which have basically just been quadratic equations. We looked at four different methods for solving those. Now we move on to all these different types of equations. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is polynomial equations. And you know what polynomials are. Here's a little review of them up above. They can be first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree. They just might not fall into the family of quadratic equations, so we call them polynomial equations when they begin to be uh, degrees of higher level. So there's various um, factoring methods that work here. Like for instance, in the first um, example that we have here, we have 4x to the fourth degree and a 12x to the second degree. And we can factor this just by First of all, getting everything on one side, as you always have to do when you're factoring and using the greatest common factor um, method for factoring it. Okay, so we're going to bring this over here. At that point, you're going to have 4x to the fourth minus 12x squared is equal to zero. So you're always going to zero out your equation get it in that form before you start factoring. And that was true even when we were looking at um, factoring trinomials in, in the last section. Okay, so now if we look at the two terms that we have here, notice that four is the biggest number that divides into both of these coefficients and both of these terms have at least an x squared as part of their, um, as part of the term. So we're gonna take out didn't write that four very nice, a four X squared. Whenever you're taking out a GCF, you always put one parenthesis next to it. And this GCF that you took out from these two terms acts as a multiplier to get back each of the terms that you took it out of. So you ask yourself four X squared times what would give you this back again? And that would be x squared because 4x squared times x squared is 4x to the fourth. Then 4x squared times what would give you negative 12x squared? That would be just negative 3. This times this would be negative 12 with the x squared coming from the GCF. So it's all factored. And then once you get it factored, you can ask yourself whether or not you have factored it completely. Sometimes what you end up with right here can be factored even further. I mean, if this had been like the difference of squares, if that had been a square and that had been a square, we could factor further, but we can't factor any further. So since you cannot factor any further, you're going to go into setting up equations using the two factors. This is one factor, the one that you pulled out. We're using the zero factor principle. where We can set each factor equal to zero and find the solutions. The other equation that we're going to solve is created from the other factor x squared minus 3 and now since both of these are quadratic equations any of the methods that we learned for solving quadratic equations in section 1.5 are fair game this one you can solve just by isolating um, the squared term in other words getting rid of the coefficient first and using the square root property. But remember when you were using that technique that you never take the square root until the last step. So therefore you would remove any numbers that the squared term is being multiplied by or that are being added or subtracted to the squared term. So we're gonna get rid of this. That leaves us with just x squared while leaving us with a zero on the right hand side. Then we're gonna apply the square root property And that gives us an X on this side. And typically we report both the positive and the negative root, but zero doesn't actually, can't actually be both signs. So there's just one root. That's why that doesn't apply just for this one number because zero doesn't have a sign. 
So zero, square root of zero is zero. So that's the one solution we got off of this equation. And then we try to solve this, which we will get two solutions for. So we're going to bring negative 3 over here. That turns it into a positive 3. We then have x squared is equal to 3 and apply the square root property again. To remove the square, then we have to apply uh, the square root to that side as well. Whatever operation you do to one side, you must do to the other side. Report both the positive and the negative root, which this number, because it's not a 0, actually does have a positive and a negative root. So here we have x, and here we have plus or minus square root of 3. So that finally, your solutions are 0, positive square root of 3, and negative square root of 3. I don't know that my math lab will be fussy, but if they are, put them in descending order. With the smallest one first, which would be the negative, then the 0, then the square root of 3, if they want you to put them in order. Okay, then we're going to move to the next one, which we have talked a little bit about because I introduced in section 1.5 a method for factoring uh, quadratic trinomials when you had three terms. And as part of that method called splitting the middle term, we uh, actually reviewed how to factor by grouping, which is for four terms, because when you're splitting the middle term, you're turning your trinomial into four terms, just like what you see here. So that's what we're going to be applying here. We will once again be going into factor by grouping, which works for four terms. It can actually work for other, other things as well, but let's move into, we'll talk about that if we need to. So first, again, any factoring method, you're going to bring everything on one side. So we'll bring the 8x over here. It'll become negative 8x. We'll bring the 12 over here as well, and it'll become negative 12. So we've zeroed out one side, just like we always need to when we're factoring. And the terms that we have are 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 8x minus 12. Everything on the left hand side. Now we're going to start grouping. We group two terms together at a time. These don't have any kind of a coefficient in common, but they do have at least, both of them have at least two x's. So we'll take out x to a power of 2. They both have x squared. What we've pulled out we use as a multiplier to regain these original terms. So x squared times what gives you 2x cubed? 2x. x squared times what gives you 3x squared? That would be a 3. Then we're going to move to the back terms and forget about the front two terms and just say what is the GCF? What do these have in common? They both have a negative in common and the biggest number that goes into 8 as well as 12 would be a 4 so that's what we will say is common to both of those terms one parenthesis next to your GCF always, and then ask yourself, what can I multiply that GCF by to regain each of the terms that you took it out of? So negative 4 times what gives you negative 8x, that would be 2x. Negative 4 times what give you negative 12, positive 3. These should match at this point. Notice that both of these terms, this first term before the minus sign and the term after the minus sign, both have a 2x plus 3. So you can take out a third GCF. We took one out from the front two terms, a different one out from the back two terms, and now for a third time, we're taking out a GCF. That GCF now happens to be this expression, 2x plus 3. It occurs as part of this term as well as this term. So we're going to take that out as the GCF. Always put one parenthesis next to your GCF. And then these terms that you took out, fill in this back parenthesis. Now in this problem, it just so happens that you have not finished factoring. There's plenty of problems where you can apply one form of factoring, but yet you can still do more. And that would be for this factor right here. That can be factored further. This is called the difference of squares. And the way that this gets factored is by taking the square root of the front term and putting it in the front position of each parenthesis, then by taking the square root of the back term 
and that fills in the back position of each parenthesis and then alternate those signs. In other words, put a plus in one of the parentheses and a minus in the other one. It doesn't matter which place you put the minus or the plus. So all I did is take the square root of this to do the, you know, to get it factored, and I took the square root of this. Okay, very easy to factor difference of squares. Just take the square to the front term, square to the back term and then bring down that 2x plus 3. Notice that in this problem, the highest degree was third degree, which means you're going to have three answers. And those answers are going to come from the three factors that you see there. Okay, so we have all first degree factors, and when your factors um, are, when you factor it as completely as you can, you will continue the problem to find the solutions by setting each factor equal to zero. So I'm going to take that first one, set it equal to zero, and solve it. I'm going to take the next factor called x plus, x plus 2, set that equal to zero, and solve it. And then I'll take this last factor, x minus 2, and set it equal to zero, and solve it. So solving the first one, move the 3 over to the side where the zero is. It'll become negative 3, while the 2x will remain here. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 2, and I get 3 halves. Then here I'm going to move the positive 2 to the other side. That gets negative 2. Then I'm going to remove the negative. I'm going to move the negative 2 in this one to the other side, and that gives you x is equal to positive 2. And there you have your three solutions. You have negative 2 being the smallest one, then you have negative 1 and a half, and then you also have positive 2 if you want to put them in a solution set. Okay, moving to the next page, we have radical equations. Radical equations have a tendency to introduce answers, uh, solutions that are called extraneous solutions, which means you're not doing any illegal operations, you may not have made any mistakes. Um, throughout the problem, but um, they can produce solutions that when plugged in, in order to check whether the solution is correct or not, you get a false statement, meaning that it's really not a solution. So radicals have a tendency to do that. Make sure that anything having to do with radicals that you are checking your solutions. Okay, so in this particular problem, um, at the top, all we have is an example of a radical, a very simple radical equation, and it starts off with a square root. So the idea is to understand what is the inverse operation of taking a square root, because you want the square root to go away, and that inverse operation is squaring. So squaring will make the square root come go away, and out pops the x. But remember, whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other side. As stated, you can sometimes produce false solutions when you're doing this particular procedure, so make sure and check them. Okay, now I'm starting you off with things that are hard because they are the ones that you're going to have questions about, the ones that are going to challenge you rather than something like this, which almost all students would tend to get right. So let's go ahead and tackle these harder ones. When you are doing these problems, just like you saw happening in this simplistic problem, you have to isolate the squared term. That's, that radical expression needs to be all by itself on one side before you go into this operation of squaring both sides. Likewise here. Before you go into squaring each side, in order to get rid of this square root, you want to bring this 3 to the other side, getting the square root expression, the radical expression, all by itself. Okay, the reason that this is this 3 when it comes over here is negative 3. The reason this is cha more challenging for students is because you're going to be foiling. And possibly you know the shortcut for foiling here, which I have. I keep introducing as I do the problems because some problems have several steps. And being able to shorten out and take out three or four steps by knowing a shortcut is really handy. So you want to try and, you know, get those in your pocket, the shortcuts. Okay, so now that we've isolated the square root, we want to get rid of the square root, which means we're going to square. 
Therefore, we have to do the same operation on the other side, and this means foil. Even though there is a